Derek Wheatley and welcome to episode 94 of the Weekly Weekly Podcast. Thank you very much for joining us today, um, whether it's on YouTube or, or on the podcast uh, platform somewhere. Uh, I want to thank my last guest, Asbestos, for coming on. A very strange experience talking to a man with a mirror on his head, but a very rewarding one because he um, talked a lot about, obviously, his art, but then to do with the housing crisis, which he has addressed in his art and we talked quite a lot about mental health towards the end and how we should how talking about it helps an awful lot and um i thought he was spot on on that and i've tried to kind of say that quite a bit in the podcast throughout the uh, many episodes that we've already had so thank you very much asbestos um subscribe to our youtube channel if you would that's very uh, helpful and as always thanks everyone for your support during the week and all the stuff that we put out there it's very um rewarding but Listen, I'm going to introduce the guest today. She is a, an Ulster and an Irish international rugby star, and her name is Brittany Hogan. Brittany, how are you doing? Hi there, Derek. I'm doing good, yeah. Very doing good. good it's, tipping away. <laughs> it's, it's very nice to have the, the, um, the Northern accent back on the, uh, the podcast. It's, uh, <laughs> we, it's been, we had a, a Tyrone man on a good while ago now, but it's, it's nice to have it back in, um, in its truest form. Um, so to back that up, uh, could you give us a short history of your upbringing, please? Um, yeah, so, well, my name's Brittany. I um, grew up in a small town called uh, Clinchy. It's kind of near Downpatrick. That's where I went to school. I went to school in Down High, and it's actually the same school as a couple of other players have come from, like like some Ashley Baxter and now Zach Ward and Tommy Seymour was there as well. Oh. Um, so, yeah, that was Down High. We I was there from... Um, for my secondary school I went to Clinchy Primary School in my town it's a really small town still live there now um, and then whenever I was going to university I got offered a contract for the Sevens uh, Sevens Rugby down in Dublin so I had to up and move and come down to Dublin and I've been living near Blanche near the uh, High Performance Centre ever since so the past three Three and a bit years. Um, so, do you like living in Dublin? Yeah, yeah. No, I like Dublin. I like the I like the people. Whenever you're speaking about my accent, there it's a bit tainted because my <laughs> um my all my housemates are actually from Munster. So, well, two of them oh. are from Leinster now, but they origi- originally um the OGs, I suppose, two years ago they were all from Munster. So I um go home and I'm told that I sound like I'm Irish and I'm like, <laughs> sound like I have an Irish accent but um no I do I love the people in Dublin it's a little bit um we are actually on the outskirts of Dublin because we're around where the training center is um so it's not as like you have to go into town to kind of experience it a little mm. bit more but like apart from that I'm right beside work I'm loving the people and having coffee shops up open all the time is great as well only one in clinchy <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure it's very busy though um but like uh, it's funny about accents like because uh i probably said this before in the podcast but when i was growing up i was going to school in dublin but i was from here in that and uh we we travel up and down you know and uh in dublin i was always the, the culture at accent but when i came back here after a couple of years it was i was like a dub they thought it sounded like a dub and i couldn't hear either you know it was yeah. like you can't i suppose you can't hear your own accent as well like but uh, yeah. yeah you're you're it slowly starts to dilute and depending on who you live with like you were saying it does yeah. start to change a little bit um but so Brittany, when did you first become aware of mental health um i suppose so I kind of, I had quite a um, complicated, well, not complicated, but like up and down, um, upbringing in my teens and stuff like that there. So I was actually introduced to a counsellor or a therapist whenever I was 12. Mm. Um, and I've been with one ever since. So I suppose I've kind of known mental health through my own um, struggles and my own awareness of it. Um, and my own like knowledge of it now, I'm quite the expert. 11 years in so. yeah um, um but that's probably whenever I started to know about it I suppose before that it wouldn't have really been um spoken about in primary mm. school or anything so um yeah probably through my own my own awareness and own experience 
It's great about, uh, and I was talking on the la- with Asbestos on the last uh, show of the um, kind of emergence of people being able to talk about it and coming out and, and you know, being comfortable because um, I like to think that more and more people are seeing it as, as normal as, as is what it is, you know, and uh, yeah. for people to come out and like we will get to this later in, in the episode, but that idea of, you know, within a group, for you to be someone who's talking about it and like you said, have been experiencing it for a number of years through a counselor. Um, I'm sure you're a very important figure in the group for that. And people will, and I, you know, I like to see myself in that position in, in certain situations as well, because I talk about it a lot that I'd like to think the people would be very comfortable coming to me about it and, yeah, you know, being, being open with it. So let's go back and were you particularly sporty as a child? I loved sports. Yeah. Okay. Loved it. It was my, Sports was my out from everything. Mm. It was my, I played every sport I could, uh, just any sport that my school offered me, to be honest. Um, and I was so competitive that I loved being good at it um, yeah. or just loved winning. So like, but like I wasn't, I wasn't um, aggressive or overly, <laughs> overly, um, what do you call it? When it takes all attitude type, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't kind of like that. I was more like, oh, this is class crack. I love this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I loved it. I adored it. I played. I mostly played hockey in my field hockey in my prime. Sorry, not in my primary school. In my secondary school, mm. and then um, like other sports that kind of run around that were like netball and cricket and just anything. I read in an interview with you, and uh, correct me if this is wrong, but you started playing rugby when you're 16. Yeah, 15. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. to me that doesn't compute because obviously you're 23 now. Yeah. yeah. So um, you're an Irish international. You're playing for Ulster. You play uh, rugby sevens, and you only started when you're 16. I always think of the or 15. Sorry. So I always think of the idea as someone who started playing. Or like, you know, an international rugby player would start when they were eight or nine and go from yeah. there. Like, um, Who introduced you to it? It was actually one of my friends from a hockey team. So okay. um, she's she's called Hannah Beatty and she was in the year, she's in the year above me in school. And we just, we got very close on the hockey team and like we would have known each other because it was like senior hockey team is hmm. um, a mixture of years. So um the hockey was Monday and Wednesday and then she said oh I go to a rugby club on Tuesday and Thursday so do you want to come and I was like yeah and I went and ever since then I've I loved it like so um yeah that's whenever I was 15 and I joined Van Hinch rugby club then. Were people uh was that like was the family situation and was people around you into rugby or was that literally the the, the kind of introduction to it? My immediate family, like my mum and my dad and stuff, wouldn't be too into rugby. No, they'd be more like um, my dad loves Gaelic football and soccer. Right. Like he, he's a, he's a, I haven't seen anyone as obsessed with Liverpool Football Club in my life. Um, but he, my uh, granda, so my mum's dad, um, he was six foot seven and he, he loves rugby. He he played it growing up. Um, throughout school throughout club throughout Everton like he loves it he adores rugby so he's probably the one that um he went to every one of my games whenever mm. I had started playing with my mum and my mum just learned it with him <laughs> so um yeah it's it's um it's brilliant to think that like I suppose it's brilliant for people listening, I guess and if you know parents might be listening to this or even younger people might be listening to this and thinking that I didn't start at this sport until I was, you know, 15, 16. There's no chance of me, you know, becoming, you know, something that I want to be in the sport. It's great to think that there is, and it doesn't have to be an introduction. Obviously your sporty back- background helped you a lot with it as well. But like the idea that, you know, you, you weren't into, I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around it. I find it kind of crazy that that was the age, but it's, it's obviously, it's brilliant. Do you remember, what do you remember about your first kind of your first game? Like even like for for Ballon and Hinch, like do you remember much about it? Um, my first game for Ballon and Hinch, I'm pretty sure was like an underage, um, underage game at the city of Armagh. We had like some, we had like a 
small, I can't remember how many aside it was. It might have been 10 aside on like half a pitch. Um, just kind of like those minis sort of mm. tournaments. And um, I don't really remember too much about it other than loving like getting stuck in and <laughs> the contact. Like I just loved it. And um, yeah, like I I'm more so remember the feeling than mm. the actual um, running about and, you know, being um, welcomed to rugby fitness and stuff. Um, but the feeling was like, oh, this is actually, I actually really like this. And um, kind of getting to learn it a wee bit more as well. Like, mm. I know that you said about the, the age thing, but there's actually girls in the rugby set. Like, I am I joined rugby a lot earlier than the girls in the sevens have. Um, there's a few girls that got picked up in college because they were just athletes. And... Um, and they've turned out to be amazing rugby players. So like people have just been scouted from certain ages. I went through the talent ID pathway with the under 18s. Um, but like there's a few, it's it's not so um, prevalent now, but like a few years back, um, people would have got scouted into sevens at uh, the ages of like 20, 20 plus. Um, yeah, so I, I suppose me with my, transferable skills like I played Gaelic football as well and hockey and that kind of really helped me um to pick it up easily so yeah. if anybody was thinking about joining a sport whenever they're 15 16 like rugby that they're like oh no I've actually never played it before don't know any rules I'm crapping myself for this like it's absolutely fine if you just try out as much as you can yeah absolutely it's 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 brilliant um how does someone you know I, I suppose this counts for every kind of field sport, team sport, but how do you find your position on the field? You get, well, I certainly got a lot of help from my coaches mm. and it was more like, um, it was more what I would do in training, kind of what skills and attributes I had in training. And they were like, oh, that actually would really suit this position mm. or really suit this other position. And I'd play that. And if I enjoyed it, great. If I didn't, then not so great. Um, and we'll change and we'll move you about to find somewhere that you're comfortable and best at. Because like rugby, of course, well, 15s anyway, um, there's so many different positions and mm. each position has its own qualities. So, um, yeah, I was kind of just my qualities were kind of seen in training skills were seen in training. And then my first game I was put in a position and then I kind of, I, I was put in center and mm. I really enjoyed it. So I was kept there. And, um, until I got a bit, I, until I got into, um, higher level and I was actually seen as a quite a slow center. So I got put <laughs> back into the, um, one who loved con- contact. So I got put into the back row. I got put into the forwards then. <laughs> Yeah, and like you, you, uh, you're in second row. That's what you're listed on uh, at the at the minute. And there was another. Uh, um, I'm probably ignorant to, to certain things. The lock is um, is a different position. What what the the so? Can you actually? This is the best way to do it. Can you explain what a second row does? So I would actually play. I would cover both second row and back row. And okay. primarily now I'd be going into the back row. So six, seven, eight. But the lock is four and five, and they're just they're just the engine room of mm. the team. Like they just work from zero to eighty minutes, just nonstop at the same kind of at the same kind of speed. I suppose yeah. like you're you're constantly working and you're constantly dying. Um, so like you would be hitting rocks, you'd be hitting more of the contact, you'd be more of the players in the middle of the field who mm. would crash ball and um, get secure ball and get gain line. And kind of just doing all the grunt work. Um, of course, with the set piece, you have the line outs. Line outs mm. would probably like they'd have to be your speciality. Um, and then you'd work with the front row who give you the platform for the scrums, and you just have to bring that power behind them. So it's a multitude of things, but um mainly just the powerhouse and like the engine yeah. room people who just have to keep going and going and trudging. I've been talking about uh, Ian Henderson for for uh, many a year, and uh, even before. He was starting to become, you know, the this the kind of stay in there like international. Um, I've always loved uh, Ian Anderson. I think he's a brilliant player, and that's yeah. my um that's my input. Listen, Brittany, I'm just going to throw a little bit of an advert in here, and we'll get back to it. Is that right? Yep. 
cool. Okay. Fusion Training Center, Monksland at Lone. A place to train in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, kickboxing, martial arts, and CrossFit. A great atmosphere with experienced coaches and a real sense of community. If you want to join the team, find us on Facebook at Fusion Training Center or drop in for a chat. Fusion Training Center. Train like a warrior. That's that one done. Okay. You have to cover all bases, as you know, Brittany. Um, so when you got called up for, we'll, we'll start with the 15s, I guess. When you got called up for the 15s, um, how did you find out about the call up, actually, first of all? Uh, so I suppose with the, so I like started uh, my rugby journey playing 15s and I played a season at AAL and I played a season uh, with Ballon Hinch in the Ulster, in the Ulster League for senior rugby. Um, so whenever I got called into the sevens, I was always constantly saying to our head coach, like, um, when can I go? Can I try this out? Can I, you know, can we got camps? Can I even play for my club? Can, you know, just feeding ideas and kind of spoon feeding and making them second guess <laughs> <laughs> and just dropping hints, dropping ideas. And um, I suppose two years later, just after COVID hit, um, he gave me a call and was like, OK, uh, we've got a Six Nations coming up in, I think it was last November, it was either October, November. Um, so f- we've got against Italy. Um, so if you want to join the squad from August, we would you know, love to have you. And I think it's a good time to put you in now. So um, that's how that's how I heard. Mm. It's a. Uh... It must be quite a, a quite a thing for you, and, and quite a thing for your grandfather that you you, you mentioned. It must have been quite a, a, a bit of um, pride for him. Yeah, yeah, definitely. He he certainly uh, loves watching. He actually, um, I miss seeing him on the sidelines as well. And we mm. haven't been able to play in Ireland yet. Um, the Novembers are coming up now in the next. Sorry, this weekend and next weekend. But because I've got Dubai with the sevens, I'm not involved. So. I still haven't been able to play at home and play with my mm. family in the home crowd. Um, just because I think, I think it was in the Six Nations there, we had a home game. But um, with COVID, they weren't a lot. I can't remember just with yeah. the, something happened, but they still haven't been able to come watch me. And um, yeah, no, it was immense pride. I rang my mom, I rang my family text into our, our extended family group chat mm. Ryan my granda and it was just like I was in sh- I was in complete shock and then I was in complete shock to be put into the squad and in the first place never mind get selected for the Italy game in November and as, as soon as I done that like I oh I was completely over the moon and so excited um it was obviously one of my dream because I started in 15 so it was mm. obviously my dream a dream of mine to play 15s for Ireland um I obviously wanted to play f- rug like rugby for Ireland. That's what I wanted to do, and that was my dream. And whenever that happened with the sevens, like it was like in- amazing. But then whenever yeah. I came into the fifteens, it was just kind of like this is where this is where I started, and you know, this is what my grandma loves. I <laughs> yeah. Um, this is kind of where this is home. This is where I was. Um, this is where I began. So it was great to be able to get. Um, the call up and I really enjoyed it yeah I am um, it's I, I started getting to see the women's rugby obviously like when everybody else did it depends on the exposure of you know the television uh, it becoming uh, more frequent on television and I remember on on it was I don't know maybe it was like five or six years ago in one of the um, six nations and obviously Ireland were doing particularly well and the exposure started to become more and more and it was great and it was brilliant to see what's what's great about it now is like that some of the real legends of women's rugby are still playing in the yeah. Irish team you know because we I guess it's because of the fact that it's taken a uh, ridiculously long time for the the TV stations to start, start showing us and then you know um obviously there's hardcore fans going into it all the time but um when you step into it, into the 15s team and uh, some of those names that were, you would have known since you were, you know, quite young, like, how is that? Because I would I would imagine, now this is in my own anxiety riddled head, I would imagine it was quite a daunting experience. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. I am a big, I am a big uh, fangirl, to be honest. I am, um, 
even now, whenever I be training in the sevens, um, I'm training with the likes of Lucy Mulhall, Emily Murphy Crow, and Stacey Flood, and like people that I watched in my first. So we we got we got our under eighteen caps, and uh, we got our under eighteen caps presented at one of the R sevens tournaments in UCD. And I remember watching them and I watched them a few years before that as well. But I was like, this is the first time I've actually seen them in real life. Like this is class. And now I see them every single day. Yeah. I train with them. I travel with them. I play with them. And it is just like, I'm actually, you know, actually friends with them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, so like whenever I went into the 15s and like whenever, because Claire Malloy and Kira, and Kira Griffin, um, are in my position and they're obviously um been about for a lot of caps a lot of years and Keir is obviously our captain um and I was just completely starstruck and see whenever they would actually speak to you um which obviously they do mm. it was I was com- in complete awe and like the likes of Lindsay Pete like Kleena Sene they've there's actually quite a lot of the girls I'm probably missing some because there's so mm. many that um have been in the squad since they have been since I started watching and since I watched the games um so because I started watching before I started playing like so it was uh it's still still weird to me every day and still weird to me every 15s camp and every game that I'm actually running and playing beside people that I have grew up to yeah grew up to love grew up to um look look up to kind of idolize them in a way and yeah, then you're sort yeah. of suddenly playing with them is, is pretty crazy so yeah. can you describe then because people may not know um the game of sevens I, I, I kind of caught up with it myself uh, through the olympics when it first became uh you know in mm-hmm. the olympics what what is uh sevens rugby so sevens rugby it is it has the exact same rules as 15s rugby does except um on the full pitch there's only seven people instead of 15 people for each team um, you'll play seven minutes aside and you'll have a two minute break in the middle. So the whole game is 14 minutes and you'll have 12 players the whole mm. game. Um, the way the tournaments run, we're um, on the World Series. Ireland are on the World Series. So there's 12 teams that go to each of those World Series. and We have, I think we have eight, eight tournaments around the year now. Um, so we'd start in Colorado, go to Dubai, go to Cape Town then go to Sydney and Hamilton down Japan, Canada, France. Like we, it's literally the world series. You go everywhere mm. um, and it plays in like a tournament mode. So you have two days and you'll play, you'll be in a pool of four, normally a pool of four. So you'll have three games, three pool games on day one. And depending on your stand and then um you'll go into day two which is finals day so that's mm. quarterfinal semi-final final or quarterfinal um fifth place final like kind of just depending on your spots and throughout the throughout the eight tournaments over the year there'll be like there will be points for each tournament to where you're ranked and then at the end of the year, so you have a winner of each tournament, mm. sec, first, second, third of each tournament. But at the end of the year, you also have an overall first, second, third. And those can go for um, qualification for the World Cup, for the Olympics, um, yeah. that sort of way. And then you'll have your Euros in um, June, July. And that would be, wow. be about it. It's yeah, b- it's pretty <laughs> it's a busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's intense. Um, if so, if you for people who haven't seen rugby sevens, it's ferociously paced yeah. um, game of rugby. Um, so, how does your position differ on on the field then in sevens? So, with sevens, it's a little bit more blurred. The positions, okay. um, everybody kind of has a similar role in open play. You'll obviously have people who have different strengths and mm. different super strengths. Like my super strength will be a lot more different to the likes of Lucy or Emily, um, who are backs. I'm mm. a forward in sevens, so. Um, as a forward there's only three of you um, and there's four backs so the three forwards there'll be two props and a hooker and um, you could do scrums and you do line outs and that's basically it um, that's basically the only main difference kind of structurally mm. uh, between the two positions but then an open play like um, if someone beside you carry like you have to pass as well as the backs you have to carry mm. Um, as well as the backs, you have to 
uh, rock. You have to you have to do everything. Um, so it's kind of more of a rounded skill set that you have to have. Um, I'm obviously a different player than what the likes of Amy Murphy Crow is because mm. she's one of the fastest people on the world. It like on the World Series. Mm. Um, so she's our winner and she like scores basically all of our tries. She is lightning quick. So her super strength is like her her speed, her her defense, like her able mm. to chase back and then we catch up with her and <laughs> catch up. Um, and like her her footwork and her pace, um, whereas my super strength would have to be more kind of getting gain line or um, clear out rocks and trying to get that kind of like, yeah, gain line kind of more of the game um, and make sure we win the set piece as well. So um, it mo- has, yeah. it benef- has it benefited your 15s game? Yeah, definitely. Because okay. the um, because you have to be good like as I said a well-rounded um athlete so like my strength power fitness in more of like a physiological sense Mm. um strength power fitness and my ability to work in high heat uh, under pressure um and because we have six games over two days that's you have to have so much you have to have a good amount of endurance as well Mm. um so that helps me physiologically for the 15s we'd have to be fitter um and then like skill set wise your passing and like your kind of fit work into contact and that area of the game has to be higher as well yeah um just just for sevens because it's more individual more individual like it's more one-on-ones mm. instead of having no space and making contact but i suppose that's where sevens um the difference is whenever i went into 15s is that close that close contact areas where i you actually you have to go through three people Mm. and you just have to recycle the ball or um the set piece is so much different um so it took me a good a good while to kind of learn the grasp of that i lift i do line outs and i do scrums in sevens but it's like it i had the technical ability to do it Mm. but the actual tactical awareness of um, the different moves off a line out or um, how a scrum feels whenever you're in the second row, back row is mm. just so different. And um, yeah, I'm running about for 80 minutes instead of 14 is a bit different <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um, now I, I was doing obviously some research when you agreed to come on and uh, the internet can be you know wrong a lot of the time, but did you score a try on your debut against New Zealand. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that is, that, well, I'm glad the internet was right, but that is quite, uh, quite a feat, I think. Yeah, that was my first and my only try, yes, on the series. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, against New Zealand, though, it counts for, it counts for more. I think, like, because, you know, I'm new to the sevens, you know, as like I said, it was an Olympics thing that got me into it, but it, it's primarily was it a, a southern hemisphere thing before it kind of came to the northern hemisphere or am i right with that um the southern hemisphere is cert- well new zealand anyway certainly yeah. dominate sevens uh both men and women yeah the men the men are not so much as, fiji is it fiji or- yeah fiji south africa like you like they it kind of differs tournament mm. to tournament but new zealand are always top eight um with the men but the women like they've won Mm. every world series for the past long like while and mm. they are just um like it's you'd, you'd put it to them like fair fair play to you yeah. they are the best team in the world and they're so far ahead of other teams at the moment um the, the gap is certainly closing especially mm. whenever you saw in the olympics there the gap is definitely closing um but last year um before COVID in the series like they'd just be unbeatable you couldn't mm. touch them like the cl- the players that they have are just top class yeah I I noted in particular when they were on the Olymp- in the Olympics the the speed of the the New Zealand players just to seem to be um now that look the speed of all the players on the rugby sevens fair play but it just in particular the New Zealand players seem to be just like lightning um mm. how I, I'm you know, if there's a, a big disappointment within a camp, you know, whether it's you didn't qualify for something, you've, like you lost a particular, particularly big game. Um, as a group, how how is that dealt with? It fascinates me is like you see the players going down the tunnel and they all look disappointed. But when they get in there, 
I'm always wondering like what I know I, occasions are different I understand that but as a group how do you deal with that so it's with with us and because we um with, well with the 15s anyway like it's a completely amateur setup the girls mm. sacrifice everything to be there and it's you only get to play for Ireland at the Six Nations maybe in November internationals um so that's about what five six times mm. a year and like the jersey means so much to girls both in the sevens and 15s and it like the, the green wearing the green jersey and the pride behind that is just immense so your every day goes into mm. working towards it and um taking off work for it sacrificing money for it, sacrificing your uni for it, your uh, family time like not being able to go home during covid to see your family um and friends and college life and everything just is completely sacrificed especially with the girls who live far away like the likes Kier Griffin is our mm. captain she comes from Kerry every weekend mm. and um and to get time off the games and stuff like the amount of behind the scenes like love sweat and tears mm. that goes behind actually playing for a start is just immense so whenever you don't um whenever you don't perform like you are like like you expect yourself to or like that you normally do it really it really really hurts your heart mm. um and the kind of whenever we were over in Italy there like the main with the 15s for the world cup qualifiers whenever we didn't qualify like the main thing that we tried to do was just support each other because we knew that there was nothing that you can do there's nothing that you can say um, there's nothing that you can yeah there's nothing that you can do there's no activity there's mm. uh, no one from the outside will understand what's happening and the emotions that you feel but the most important thing was us just to show our emotion and support each other and just know that we're there and then hopefully in a few months time whenever it's actually settled in and you feel like you know it's hurts a little bit less then you can start talking about it then mm. you can start making plans and action um and kind of seeing um what to do and how to take care of yourself um so yeah a lot of support to each other a lot of self-care things mm. and um trying to be compassionate to your mind and not yeah, yeah it's that that's kind of what I try to do anyway is just be completely compassionate and loving towards myself because if I don't if I if I I've been really hard on myself in the past. If that happens, it's you just it makes you feel so much worse, mm. and you um it takes you twice, maybe three times, and maybe it will stick with you for even for a long, long time. And yeah. um, if you don't actually do that, and um, yeah, that's kind of difficult. And then with the with the sevens, like if you lose a game, you have another game in two hours. So you, you have to, you just have to turn around. You have to uh, flip that switch. And I suppose that we try to make sure that we, we do our, we do our recovery first. Um, after we do our recovery first after a game, and then we go straight to analysis and say like, what, what did we do wrong there? What happened? Uh, what happened there? And how can we fix it to the next game? And how can we change our tactics to try and beat this team? Mm. And um, your emotions kind of, you just have to, you just have to turn around. You have to be, and um, that's where I think that my resilience has been built with mm. is that if you lose a game on day one, you have to turn around to the next game because if you don't and you lose a second game, third game, then you're, you're out of uh, quarterfinals. You're out of, like mm. you're, you've kind of, dug a hole for yourself in day two so um the bounce back attitude of like oh we actually have an opportunity to play again in two hours great let's let's go do it um and then again uh two hours and then you have the night off where you can kind of relax try and show yourself some um compassion and mm. ch talk to your teammates and support them see how everybody is doing check in on everybody and then go right okay time to sleep eat and get ready for day, day two and then whenever we come home it's just a full rugby deload um you don't talk about it you don't watch it you don't do anything because it's 
you're in such a high pressured environment for like whenever we were away uh, with the 15s normally it's not as long as we were in Italy um you'd only be really away for about four or five days but like Italy we were away for 19 I think um and the group have never been away for like mm. for that long before with each other so it just you just needed you just needed a detox and um after the sevens we normally get a week off after each tournament so it's kind of that to just deload and then you can kind of crash and then come back up for whenever training starts again yeah um so i wanted to ask you a little bit of kind of coming off the back of that answer really is um is there a place uh, like a setup for if if someone is is struggling with mental health within the the kind of rugby setup yeah so we actually have a, a, a body that helps represent us it's called the rugby players ireland rpi don't know if you've heard of it but that's um that's where we get our support like mm. network from so they support us in ways of like we have a like a player development manager um so each squad will be given a person who's in a full-time role that will look after the squad so if you have any issues that is like i have a deadline for college next week and i'm also have a game on that day how do I tell my, how do I guess it extended or how, like, how do I work around that? Or like, if you're trying to work with your finances, they'll help you. You're um, outside, like trying to balance your outside of rugby mm. life with your rugby life so that you don't um, pull yourself too thin and end up not excelling in any of them. Mm. Um but they also have mental health help and that's where we would normally go to is we go to our player development officer they would offer us six and i think it's six sessions a year we'd get with um a psychologist or kind of whoever they they think would be best in our avenue and um, where like who would help who can help us best this person can okay let's go to them and see if they work and um and see if they help you and if you know if that's kind of who we who we would go to and um it's not like certainly with my experience anyway it's kind of you wouldn't really go to them unless you're struggling Mm -hmm. or unless you're um unless you're oh sorry I've, i've completely forgot Sorry. You wouldn't really go to them unless you're struggling because you wouldn't really know that they're there. You wouldn't really know yeah. that you need them, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Where, like, um, whereas if you're really struggling and you have the confidence and you have actually the comfort within yourself to be like, oh no, actually, I'm going to go and try and get some help. Because mm. um, some people don't as well. And um, you could try and go get some help and then you get helped. But that's at the point where you've, you're struggling. Yeah. Whereas I don't think that um, as a squad or as a, I don't know, in team sports anyway, or in sports that people are aware that you can get that before you struggle. Yeah. You, yeah, you yeah. can get that before you reach a level that you need someone. So like um, with, with, with my personal experience, like I wouldn't, I would try and distract myself. I would be com- complete distraction method like that's why I tried every single sport under the sun mm. I was never home before nine o'clock at night and then I'd eat my dinner and I'd sleep um I was pure distraction method let's let's be happy I was I would always try and think of the positive side of things like um that's kind of the personality that I've that I've created and that's who I kind of pride myself on is being a positive and um looks on the right side person I suppose yeah but so I would constantly, if, if I was feeling bad or feeling negative thoughts or um, low self-esteem or anything, our like previous things would be buried, like previous events that had happened to me would be mm. buried underneath the sand. I wouldn't think of them. I'd be like, actually, no, that makes me sad. I don't like being sad. Yeah. So that's, you know, go away. I'm fine. And um it wasn't until I let that completely build and build and build and build and build until I hit rock bottom. And I was like, actually, no, I need some help now. Mm. Whereas if I had had the knowledge that, um, or the 
awareness that I could go to people before it gets to that level, then it would have been so much more helpful for me. Um, but yeah, no, RPI are great as they are absolutely like they're top class and they help us out so much. And we um, like those services are free to our availability mm. as players with um, as contracted players with the sevens or as just players with the 15s team. Everybody on the squad is available of them and available of their help from their player development manager to try and balance everything so that things don't you don't get overwhelmed or you don't get yeah. things don't get too much. I think what you said it was interesting about um not knowing until you're struggling and and that's that's a big thing in 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 everyday life I guess you know the idea of that and I I know I certainly got to that point and when I talk about like I talked to um uh, Niall Morgan from the Tyrone team and he explained that you know that they they did have a setup and I asked him kind of a similar question about the group dynamic that like would you be comfortable and it's interesting with your background as well like would you be comfortable in that group? You know, if a group goes away for 19 days, they, they imagine they get quite close, you know, as a group. Do you think like it's a good environment for that, for kind of approaching someone and, and kind of sharing your thoughts like before things get too bad? Yeah, well, especially with the with the seven, well, with the 15s, you don't really get enough contact time, to be honest, with okay. the squad. Like you'll be in for a camp at the weekend and the camps are so like you'd be training most of the time. They're so hard and heavy that you wouldn't really have that time for mm. kind of, um, for kind of group work or um, what's the word? Recreational. Cultural, cultural. Oh yeah. Um, like cultural kind of help dy- group mm. dynamic. You wouldn't really have the much, so much time for that. You're kind of just saying, um, you come to a Friday, be like, oh, how was your week? Great. Okay. We're in the gym. Okay. We're on pitch. We have double pitch, double pitch. Mm. Like it's just, it's too, um, it's too jam packed for you, ex- except for whenever we were in Italy where we had a little bit more work mm. for this. Um, but with the sevens anyway, like the past, especially through COVID and the past six months, past year, um, we've, with the help of Orla Curran, we've just got a new SSC coach who is top class, like, absolutely incredible incredible human incredible worker and is just one of the best in her field and thank god we have her (laughs) um she really brings in that culture and being vulnerable with one each other one another um aspect of things and she said something that was actually really interesting that girls will perform if they feel like they belong whereas for boys to belong they have to perform Mm -hmm if that makes interesting. sense interesting yeah, yeah 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 so um we're trying to put in a lot of emphasis and a lot of energy behind being connected as a squad learning actually about each other mm. um kind of our backgrounds what makes us tick what we like doing what we don't like doing instead of just rugby mm. and kind of learning about that girl outside of it um so i think that we've really We've really pushed on that and it's especially me, like I, me and uh, the captain Lucy and a couple of the other senior players have been like, right, no, this is actually really important. Mm. And because um, before COVID hit, we were coming 11th in a lot of our tournaments and we re- we were um, starting to get like really down, like mm. mentally, a lot of us. And then the group dynamics changed because that was two seasons ago with COVID. It's just, we haven't had anything. Um, so because of a few retirees and mm. new players coming into the squad, we've kind of had to re-jam um, what culture is, what our environment is and who we are. So um, trying to make sure that being vulnerable is OK and making sure that I say to younger girls coming in, the other senior girls say to other younger girls coming in, like in your different positions mm. or whoever even comes to you, like, you know, I'm here if you need me, come to me, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you how I've struggled. And then they open up or mm. then they feel more comfortable and they feel like, oh, it's not an us and them. It's just an us. It's everybody. Yeah. Um, so we've really, really tried to make that an important part of our culture at the moment. And it, I think that will be our main focus of, um, of this year, certainly. Mm. I think it's great that, uh, you know, there is that 
kind of welcoming uh, situation where you're talking about like if you are struggling because it, it it addressing the issue so early is something that's so important. I think you know yeah. it's like it's like talking about it before, um, you know, someone is even thinking about it. Some new new person coming into the group is really important. Um, so what when before how do you get pumped for a game? Pumped. Yeah, pumped. <laughs> um, to be honest, like with the build up. Um, with the build-up of training beforehand so you'd have you'd have like training blocks of four weeks or something between tournaments um so you'd have like a kind of oh we've just come home uh let's let's relax let's chill out and then you'd have um two weeks left where training will start to bump up again you'll have a very very intense week before you go and like it's just the that just builds the excitement builds like the hunger the selection because like people actually have to get selected in that week to go and um builds that competitive drive within people and then whenever you'd be packing your bags you'd be like oh you know at the airport ready to go and then you'd be in a different country in 20 degrees hotter than Ireland and 30 degrees some places and you'd be like right we're here you'd be training uh with a smaller group of people because uh only 12 normally travel Mm. out of the 25 um so you'd be whenever you'd be away and it's just like kind of that build up training Mm. and whenever we were away in the world series you're normally in the same hotel as all the other teams as well so you'd be walking past like your opponents and the people that you're going to play and having dinner with at the team ireland team but you'd be looking at everybody else Mm. kind of being like right we're playing you in a few days this this seems real and then it's just whenever it gets to game day that and, and like you see your jersey hanging up and you're mm. with the girls and you packed your kit bag like that the build-up and getting pumped is actually easy yeah. and then and then music also helps in our change room and kind of um we would try and play a few um a few Irish songs anyway um before we before we get onto the pitch just to kind of um know where our why is and yeah get get ready get pumped and then for the 15 sure you only have five six games a year so yeah. like you've won one big build up until one game and then you've got a week and then another game and then a week and then another for mm. the six nations anyway and um again it's easy because they actually have more media towards them yeah with the six nations um than we would experience with the sevens so it's kind of easier to get pumped up in that way mm. and especially with like um the amount of people from your home club and um your home club and people that you've played with before and stuff like that there would be messaging and it would just uh give you a lot of nerves before the game and it's easy yeah easy yeah to get pumped. <laughs> I, was, I was always like fascinated by the, the you know the the dynamic of the 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 bus pulling into whatever it is, you know, whatever, wherever the uh, the stadium is, and you see the players getting off with their headphones and their earphones yeah. and all that, and it always had me thinking of like, are they? Is that like are they just cruising around like not talking to each other? Is it just because they need to focus on themselves more than the team? You know, it always kind of made me wonder: is it more of a thing of just focusing yeah, tunnel vision yeah. on yourself? Yeah. So. Um, before before you get onto the bus and before you start your warm up and stuff, you, all the team prep will be done. So okay. you'll have team you'll have team meetings. You'll have your captains run. You'll have you'll try and be as cohesive as possible in that. You'll have your jersey presentation where mm. everybody gets pumped together and everybody's really excited. And then it's kind of just winding down before the game. Mm. Some people prefer and it's especially like. Because if we'd be going to training, we'd have the speaker on. Everybody would be listening to the same things. But whenever you'd be going to a game, some people focus with uh, techno. Some people focus with like classical music. Some yeah. people focus with no music at all. And it's just kind of getting that wind down before warm up and prep starts. Because if you're switched on all day, you're going to waste so much energy. <laughs> That is true. Um, so the touring side of things, you've obviously described all the places that you go to and how much time you spend on the uh, on the road. Um, is it you know when you aren't training and you aren't playing? What? How do you manage the downtime? Can it be boring? So I've actually like before um, COVID hit, and like I, I've only just graduated. Um, well, actually, my graduation's in February, but 
I finished my undergrad there in um in May so mm. my downtime would have to be assignments <laughs> like would have to okay. be catching up with uni work and working with lectures and doing group projects and stuff like that there because I was in uni for four years so um down in DCU so it would your downtime wouldn't you, you wouldn't have too much of it you'd try and go home as much as you can mm. because you can't really um because I'd have to go up to Belfast and stuff you can't really do that during a training week mm. um or obviously whenever you're in a different country so try to go home and then just catch up um you're just constantly playing catch up on um assignments or whatever because especially with the sevens team a lot of the girls are young so they'd all still be in college and that's kind of yeah. the um that's kind of what we'd be doing but um now I suppose now with the next series starting um I've taken a year off to kind of um relax unwind and take some pressure off my head so um <laughs> the I suppose the downtime will be actual downtime where I enjoy myself yeah uh, which is obviously great and where's the next series then so we're heading to Dubai in in 10 days in what day is it today yeah we're heading to Dubai I I think it's the 21st or the 22nd of November we'll be playing at the end of November and the start of December um Dubai is it Dubai this time of the year is probably still around 40 degrees is it? It's yeah like, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah so like that's another question because well Irish people are pasty you know um, yes. um we're, we're all pasty I'm not having a go at anybody just here but we're all kind of how is it like to play in those kind of conditions see whenever you go every four weeks it's actually not too bad because okay. you'd be like sevens is played in hot countries so you'd mm. kind of be a little bit more acclimatized to it but because we haven't been away somewhere warm, um, except for Italy, the 15s, to be fair, it was actually pretty hot. But we haven't been away somewhere warm since before COVID. Um, so it will be tough. It will be very, very tough. Um, it's completely different. And I'm just happy that we have a week of training before we play. Anyway, yeah, it, yeah, I think that's it good. It will be... Uh, tough <laughs> so when it's so because you spoke quite well about the way yeah, it works with the sevens and the 15s and the 15s is obviously there's a lot less games the next um you said there was a november series obviously you're not going to yeah. be there for that but after that it's obviously the six nations that comes yeah. next and that's what february or march would be yes i think they've changed ours to just being a standalone um right. tournament so I, it's either march or the start of april and, can't and, can't remember have you got your eyes set on that then as well? I'll hopefully be back in to training okay. um, in January. Um, we'll just see kind of, because they've got obviously got a uh, new coach appointed. Mm. So I kind of just have to see what he wants and what he wants to do. So it's kind of all up to him. But I've been chatting with Anthony and he kind of runs across. Um, he's our coach and he runs across both sevens and fifteens and kind of is in, kind of in charge of what we mm. do and um kind of our season plan I suppose like he's the one that I constantly have my have my me not earn to in his ear um so I'll hopefully be back in to be playing a little bit of both for Six Nations but Which we'll see I, yeah yeah it's one of those things now where um because I've had a couple of people on the podcast you know Niall was on obviously playing for Tyrone in the final and won the, fi- the All-Ireland and you know I was delighted because you know I had chatted to him about it and we chat him so long before that there was no mention of all Ireland's for Tyrone. It was just, it was just you know. Um, and I've had Danny Nealon on, who's an MMA fighter. She won the other night on TV. So now you're you're the next person who I'd be able to follow. You know the career and kind yeah. of like it's looking. I I really enjoy that kind of thing with the, with the podcast. Um, mm-hmm. so I know I know this is kind of similar to a question I've asked already about the touring side in Borum, like. But take away rugby and take away study and all that, like. What do you like to do in your spare time when you when you do get a chance to actually relax? What do you like to do? Um. So whenever I get the chance to actually relax, I like to relax. So <laughs> like do nothing. So, yeah. um, I I actually got a puppy there two oh. months ago, a wee cockapoo. So mm. um, I'm kind of in the middle of training him, but I suppose like relaxing is either um keeping everything organized and tidy yeah. in my house um 
I love doing gardening and I love plants. I've got a lot of house plants. So like kind of just, um, it it is really relaxing, just kind of taking care of them and, um, kind of being a little bit more mindful trying to do that. I try and read sometimes I'm not the best reader, but I, I try to do so, um, or just, um, be really mindful and try it. I, I've been using Headspace, the Mm. app, um, so to try and get more present and be be better to myself and um yeah just kind of self-care things so if I have to have a bath or go for a walk or go for a coffee with friends and lunch and stuff um I'll do that but it's really my relaxing time is really unwinding and chilled yeah what what I what I really like uh, Brittany about that like you know because we spoke obviously you're being 23 and I look back at when I was 23 and, you know, I didn't have a background and, you know, someone, a counselor and th- things like that. So I didn't have that kind of advantage in, in those side of things when mindfulness, you know, which was a word and that I used to throw away and say, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. And in the last maybe 10 years, all of a sudden, like you speak about gardening there and, and plants and stuff. And like my dad would be big into his gardening and that's his mindfulness. Like, and it doesn't have to be, um, I guess it doesn't have to be something that you go, right, I have to go do something mindful now. It's not yeah. like I think I, I I want to get that across the listeners. I've probably said it before as well. But like when I, you know, go for a run, that for me is very mindful. And I think find your kind of thing. And for you, obviously, um, like what you, when you when you want to relax, you try to relax properly and, yeah. you know, give yourself a chance. Because a lot of people would be like, no, I shouldn't be sitting down watching TV now or something. And then it's like, well, why not? Like it's fine yeah. yeah and uh so yeah i like the idea of 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 that you know um i just just wanted to, to ask what are sports do you kind of follow now because obviously you, you were big into sports when you're a kid do you still kind of keep track of any teams like liverpool for instance or something? my dad does that for me yeah okay that's fair <laughs> he'd yeah. be he'd be messaging me telling me all the crack and um <laughs> i'd be going home and he'd be telling me all the three month catch up that i need to know so um but with um with rugby I suppose like pay, playing an elite sport and being an elite athlete like you kind of are around sport every single day so excuse me sorry um I wouldn't I wouldn't follow I wouldn't follow teams as rigorously as I used to or as much as I used to I'd still um I'd still like to know the you know what they've been up to and kind of how they've been getting on and stuff like that there like my home my home team, Ban Hinch, I'd obviously, I love refreshing Twitter at the weekend and mm. seeing how they got on or um, with the hockey, like we are trying to, as a household anyway, we've been trying to get better at going to support um, other international teams oh, with God. the women. So like if it's a soccer game or if it's a hockey game or somewhere that's in Dublin that we'll try our best. We couldn't get tickets for the Euros there because it was all sold out. But like we'll try our best to go and um and see that. Or there's a quite a lot of um Gaelic football players that are on our team and I love listening right. to how they're getting on. Yeah. And um that sort of way. I wouldn't be into watching too many sports I if I was kind of relaxing, unless it was a big game, if it was a mm. big game, big final, like on the TV or whatever, I'd watch it no bother. Um, or if Ulster playing, I'd obviously watch it. Yeah. But um, I'd be more kind of keeping tabs with yeah. how everybody's doing than um, using time to watch more sports, I suppose. Yeah, and it's great. Like you, t- you mentioned the Irish uh, women's team, the football team as well. Like, And it's great that we're starting to see sold out venues and we're starting yeah. to see you know, in a prime time slots on TV, it's not just a passing mention on RT news, like, which is, it's a great positive thing. It's taken far too long. Um, you know, in, in my opinion, but now that we're getting to see it and really getting to see that, uh, all, um, I, I won't say all male cause that's not really fair, but like the idea of, you know, it's not as good or, you know, whatever yeah. it is like, cause it was, it's, that goes right through all sports, you know, yeah. boxing, MMA, all those things. I'm really into MMA and the quality at the moment in, in MMA is the same level either, um, the gender. Yeah. So it's all good. But, uh, yeah, that's my little rant at the end of the podcast, but it's all good. I know. Uh, <laughs> but listen, I hear it. yeah, I hear it. thank you. Thank you. Listen, but, uh, Brittany, you've been, you've been an absolutely brilliant guest and it was a pleasure chatting to you you too thank you very much Derek
Thank you. Listen, just stick with me for one minute. I will get a picture just as I close after I close this out, and then I'll let you get on with your busy okay. schedule. Thank you very much. Okay, listen, I want to say thanks as well to John Francis for the technical side of the podcast and um, to the people who helped me put it together. Mom, my mom, dad, granddad, Duran Calvin. Subscribe to YouTube channel if you would, Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter, or Meta, or whatever it's called now. Um, <laughs> spot, did you see, actually, did you see that weird video? Um, uh, that uh, Mark Zuckerberg put up with all the weird little don't watch it it's no not... I actually haven't it's so creepy because he's trying to do this metaverse where we're all like virtual reality figures and uh, it's... do you know do watch it and then <laughs> uh, then give out to me for suggesting that you watch it okay, uh, okay. so uh, we're also on Spotify Apple Anchor Google Podcasts etc and like I said at the start, thank you everyone for tuning in um, uh, for this episode. Um, I'm sure you enjoyed it an awful lot. Um, we will definitely see you next week. Uh, Brittany, thank you once again. Thank and you. we are out. Take care, everyone. Bye.